Welcome everyone to Secret Sauce 365, where we give you the answers that business owners ask themselves questions on every day. And we are going to tackle the legal environment here uh, with today's guest. I'd like to welcome Mark Gross, partner at Fox Rothschild. Good morning, Mark. Good morning, Stan. Thank you for having me, right? Oh, you are more than welcome. Uh, you can be a guest on this show anytime. I, I always enjoy spending time talking to Mark and, and picking his brain. He's, he's one of the most intelligent people I know, and he is the master litigator, best litigator on either the east or west of the Mississippi River. So uh, our listeners are very lucky to have you today, Mark, and uh, we appreciate you taking time out of your busy schedule to join us. And on today's episode, we're going to learn the following uh, in regards to legal. We're going to learn what exactly makes up a legal contract. We're going to learn how to make sure email does not get you into big legal trouble. Uh, we're going to learn about having a proper buy-sell agreement in place for your business. And we're also going to touch base on restricted covenants, uh, post-employment things, and producer contracts. So before we get started into all those topics, our listeners are, are going to really enjoy hearing about Mark. Can you just tell us, how'd you become an attorney? What, what brought you into the field? Well, uh, Stan, it goes back to uh, really my childhood and my most formative years when I was uh, my, uh, a little kid. Some of my earliest memories are of my grandfather and father talking about issues with uh, our family's business. And over my right shoulder here is uh, an inspirational photograph. It, it's, it's my grandfather. And uh, he was an immigrant. He came to the U.S. by himself when he was about nine years old. What was his name, Mark? Louis Gross. Louis Gross. And, Nine-year-old Louis Gross coming to America. And uh, my grandfather relayed to me through all of my childhood and into my adult years, how he wanted to go to school, which he, he never did, and how he wanted to be a lawyer. He would say more than he could breathe. And uh, <laughs> he became an entrepreneur here in, in, in the United States, the land of opportunity and uh, owns uh, businesses and uh, a family business. And dad became a uh, part of the business and didn't go to law school. My uncles went into the business in law school, but I, I made that leap. And so, so Louis Gross yeah. was a very successful businessman and, but he and his children, none of them were attorneys. That's correct. And we would okay. talk about uh, business issues and family issues. Uh, unfortunately, they would become intertwined over dinner and family holidays. And I became a business lawyer. And, 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 and funny enough, my, the, the focus of my practice is representing family owned and closely held businesses. Excellent. And, and that's perfect for this podcast, because that's what we do. We talk about business issues around the table. It's all about the food, right, Mark? Well, uh, before the pandemic, it was all about the food. Stan, when you and I could <laughs> grab breakfast uh, at any time of day. And, I I know. Miss, and, and I'm looking forward to having so, to, to sharing some pancakes with you again, my friend. I do look forward to that. So it's, it's takeout for now. So so you decided to become a lawyer. And, and you know, how did that go? You know? Well, start. I've loved it. it, it it's, uh, I don't look at it as being a job. It's a passion of mine. I don't feel like I've worked a day in, in, in 25 years. Uh, I uh, love what I do. Uh, I love trying cases, although uh, I maybe try three or four cases a year, which is considered a lot. Most settle. Uh, family disputes tend to go the distance if there's something else involved other than money when you have one family member, unfortunately, yeah. looking to prove a point. Uh, but other than that, most cases resolve themselves. And, a lot of times uh, pride will get in the way of, uh, you know, intelligent compromise. Sometimes more than pride. It's a son who wants to teach a brother or a father a lesson. And the family dynamics can sometimes get in the way of reason and what's, what's best for a business. Revenge, right? Yeah. So let's talk a little bit about what makes up a legal contract. A lot of people think, well, yeah, you have to you know, write something on paper and put all the fancy words together, but, but break it down for us. When do, when do legal contracts come into play? So, uh, you know, a contract can just be a handshake. It can be a, an exchange of emails, uh, especially in business. There are very few types of agreements that need to be in writing and signed by both parties. I mean, typically it's, it's left to, uh, 
prenups or guaranteeing a, a debt or uh, buying a house. But other than that, if you're going to enter into uh, an agreement with somebody for business, you can shake hands and perform. And uh, typically what's going to be evidence of the agreement is how the parties performed. So uh, you don't always need and, and actually hardly ever need uh, a document signed by the parties for a court to find an enforceable agreement. So you're saying it could be as simple as, as a verbal exchange, a handshake, an email and a reply, someone promises this for that, and that actually becomes legally binding? Oh, for sure. I have had cases uh, where emails were sent involving uh, buying a company where a client of mine was interested in buying a company and conducting due diligence uh, up in Vermont. And a uh, court was uh, looking at the emails and the matter went to trial to determine whether these emails constituted a binding contract. So I have a, a saying that the E for emails, the E stands for evidence. And uh, you gotta be careful with what you write. Uh, you can write something uh, that you think is innocuous that four or six years later can be interpreted as something nefarious. Uh, typically, if you're going to write an email, it's good to uh, think about it, that maybe you're writing it for somebody else, uh, like a judge, uh, even though it may, may be hard to fathom that at the time that you're writing it. But you really have to watch what you write and uh, take stock, you know, not to be emotional when you're sending those emails. So many of us, uh, you know, uh, and that's a good segue for us into email. Uh, we just fire back, right? We read something, we get emotional. It's a great point you made. And uh, I'm a big fan of the 24-hour rule, um, where if something's really getting you angry or emotional, it might make sense to digest it, you know, wait the 24 hours, sleep on it, and then put together the proper reply. But that is that is a skill set that I'm looking to try and instill, uh, not just on the lawyers who work with me, but but certainly to business people. When you get an email, you do not have to respond right away, and you should not respond right away. You definitely shouldn't hit the reply and write back within the first 30 seconds, no matter what it is. You should wait. And I spend, unfortunately, a good portion of my day uh, clients sending me emails to review, revising them, sending them back and then asking the client to send the email the next day. And usually the rush is, well, I wanna send it, I wanna keep, I wanna send it. No, relax, Right. there's no rush. In fact, back before there were emails and there was a fax machine and you weren't faxing instantaneously. And before that there was mail. So there's plenty of time. Letter. Weeks, so, weeks went by, right? right? There's plenty of time. There's nothing wrong if you get an email at 3 p.m. to respond the first thing in the next morning. Slow it down. Take your time. Think about what you're writing because uh, that E in evidence can come back in a, in a deal and bite you. And uh, most of the time, if parties get into a fight uh, and, and, it, and it boils down to or, or, or erupts into some litigation, most of the time is spent on discovery. Most of the money is spent on discovery, discovering emails, going through thousands of emails, and then asking uh, a party questions under oath about them and what they meant and what did this mean and showing back and forth with, with the emails. It's, it really can be out of control. So my advice is if you can take, if there's one takeaway here for that you and I are going to spend time on this morning, it's go slow and calm down, relax with the emails. Yeah, it's it's interesting with email, and and I guess this gets developed as a skill set over time, is is they're emotionless, right? You, you, you don't see the person's face, you don't see their verbal context, their there was their voice high, low you know, unless you're putting something in caps or, you know, people do that sometimes. And I think it's really silly. Um, but, you know, you really, it, 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 it's conveying emotion, but, you know, the words can be taken out of context. You meant one thing, but it said another. So that's great advice is, is, is to really take a breath back and, and not just proofread your email, but see what it's actually saying. And do you want someone, a third party to look at this in a courtroom one day and to say, oh, okay, that's what you meant. So, um, you know, that's that's really, really great advice. Now, 
Now, how does an organization go about instituting that culture? Um, I'm sure you're trying to get your clients to understand this, but you know, sometimes organizations have thousands of employees. I mean, should there be a, 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 a you know something in the office manual about email? Well, every business should have a document retention policy. One of the problems is that if you get into a dispute and maybe there are some emails that don't look so favorably as to your position, someone will go back and, and delete some of their emails. Or don't, don't do that uh, because it leaves an electronic trail and a footprint and can be discovered. And if, there's, uh, and if you're caught, uh, deleting emails or with or having disposed of evidence, uh, it's no different than destroying evidence, whether it's electronic or some other format. And you can get into real trouble with a spoilation claim. And that means that a court can, in, can hold you to an adverse inference that if you destroy some piece of evidence, whether it's email or something else, there'll be an inference taken that you were destroying something that was going to be helpful to the other side. It won't make you look good. And parties have been known to lose cases over email destruction. So it's almost business- like uh, driving under the influence. I mean, if you if you refuse to take the breathalyzer, you, you're, you're already guilty. I mean, so, so I agree with you. You, you, and, and you can't delete the emails. A, you have right, to leave everything intact. It, it, businesses should have a document retention policy uh, regarding what you're doing with your emails. And uh, that would be another piece of advice if you, in, in terms of formulating an employee handbook. Uh, if you send an email and you're an employee for a business, you don't have a right to privacy on that email. Even if you're communicating with your lawyer and you're having a fight with your boss or, and you're owning a business and one of your employees is sending emails to his lawyer, as the owner of that business, you have the ultimate right. You own that server. No emails on that server are private. And that's often also a foray into lots of evidence as to what employees or officers of a business or co-owners might be doing uh, and doing something wrong. Uh, There's no right to privacy on emails that you're sending on your company server. That's a great point to make is is the emails are all owned by the company, not by the individual sending them because it's a corporately owned email address in most cases. Now, when do you find that it makes sense to take it out of the email arena and, and then into writing? Is there, is there a time for that? Is it based upon the complexity of what you may be doing in a contract? So bringing it back to our first topic, I mean, we covered two here, how email can, can get you in trouble, but when does it make sense to really maybe memorialize things? So the purpose for a contract is uh, not that you're going to take it out and constantly looking at it. It's usually pulled out of a drawer a year or two later when there's some question uh, about a deal. And really, when you have more and more at stake, a contract is sort of like the insurance policy. And Stan, I know you can appreciate this. It doesn't cost a lot of money to write the contract, but if something goes wrong and you don't have that insurance policy of a contract, you can be fighting and spending all kinds of money after the fact. So as deals become more complex and more money is involved, it's much better off instead of having it uh, recorded informally to have it recorded amongst the parties formally. And the way to do that is through a written contract where you set forth the terms and what happens if and when. Uh, So there's no mistake. But uh, unfortunately, the best contract in the world can't protect you from a bad actor. If you're doing business with someone who has ill intent, Uh, no contract in the world is going to save you. Uh, It it may have some remedies in there. It may increase some of your muscle in in some respects, uh, uh, depending on what the dispute is. But uh, at least you won't be arguing back and forth as to what the deal is. You pull the contract out when there's a problem. And obviously, as as the risks and rewards go up in terms of of what's at stake, you're going to want to spend the time and and invest some money in putting a deal together in writing that both parties acknowledge what that deal is and write it down like a house purchase. You're going to want that in writing, buying or selling a business. You're going to want that in writing. Right. That's, that's uh, really a a great line you had. It's not every, not every customer is going to be a good one, right? There's a lot of bad actors out there and that, that, that could be a topic for a future podcast of uh, how to, how to trust your gut, but to, to, you know, kind of finish up on the email topic here. I, I, what I, what I think I heard you say is, is that, that 
you know, the contract, if, if you take it to that last step, could really take the vagueness out of an email exchange and dialogue and really list all the points and, and it goes away in a draw and it's there like, just like an insurance policy in case there's a problem down the line. Exactly. I mean, often I'll, I'll say to clients, send me you know, a copy of the email that you sent to the other side where, that contains the deal points and we'll memorialize that in a more formal agreement. Yeah. Is there a point, uh, Josh, there's so many questions that come in my head when we start talking about email. Is there a point where you like your clients to come to you more rather than, 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 you know, they might take the day and then want to reply, but is there a point where they really should check with counsel and make sure they're, they're, they're getting the right words down? Sometimes you can tell business intuition is everything. Uh, of course, if, if we're talking about a transaction that involves lots of zeros, go check with your lawyer because, again, it's the insurance policy and it's a lot easier to, to, to uh, forecast and, and take care of the problem as it's happening rather than after the fact. But if you're getting a bad feeling from another side and you can feel it in the back of your neck, the cold pricklies, it's time to get a lawyer involved, I think. Uh, that would be my suggestion to review an email. It takes 10 minutes uh, for to have somebody else take a look at it, revise it, maybe word it a little bit differently and give you some coaching on some points on what to do. So uh, I would rely upon intuition as to when it is you need to bring somebody else in, whether it's your lawyer or your accountant or some other trusted advisor to get another set of eyes uh, on uh, the deal or package or agreement that you're formulating with somebody. So listeners, you heard that here right from the source. Mark Gross, partner at Fox Rothschild, Secret Sauce 365. It's all about the food. Trust your gut. Trust your gut and then make a decision. So, so Mark, I, I just want to mention uh, I'm, so, I'm so proud of you and what you've done at Fox Rothschild. Tell me a little bit about the firm. And I, I know you got, you're based in Morristown, right? But you, you're all over the country. So uh, primarily in Morristown, uh, as a result of, of the pandemic, unfortunately, uh, I was spending a lot of time in New York uh, about a year or so ago, and the firm has 27 offices. Uh, I've got matters, uh, believe it or not, a few in Alabama. I don't know why they're congregating there. I've tried a case in Vermont. Uh, the firm has offices on the West Coast. I have a matter in, in, out of our Palm Beach office. Uh, I've got uh, a couple of matters out of our San Francisco office. And you, you never know. I mean, uh, my clients, uh, most of which are in the New York and New Jersey metropolitan area, sometimes uh, do business, as you would imagine, out of the New York City area. And if you're going to contract business in uh, Dallas, and I have a client doing a real estate de deal there, the firm uh, has offices uh, in most commercial centers that would allow me to continue to represent the client. And it's been great for my practice. Awesome. And I believe the firm can handle all different various types of counsel, right? Any, anything needed? I mean, it's a business firm. So anything imaginable relating to a business, uh, intellectual property, trademark, patent, contracts, uh, real estate, tax issues, wills. Uh, I have clients that are getting unfortunately divorced or, or, or will handle it beforehand with a prenup. But any, any imaginable issue that a business owner uh, would face in the conduct of, of his or her business. It's something that we do. We have over uh, you know, 27 offices, almost a thousand lawyers and every specialty you can imagine that. And I don't wanna sound like a commercial, but, but oftentimes I don't have to do research. If someone comes to me with a novel issue, I can send, as we've been talking about, an email internally and I'll find an expert <laughs> here that's dealt with the problem and get an answer. Great, great. So. Let me ask you this question, because more and more businesses in our country are now uh, transacting with other countries. Um, I, I assume that there is a, a myriad of, of legal issues that get involved with that, and, and I assume your firm could help. But what, what should they think about when they start merely, uh, doing business abroad? So uh, the, one of the number one issues is if you're doing business abroad, uh, whose law governs. Uh, I did a deal within the last few months in the fall, it closed in August, September after Labor Day, uh, where a multinational uh, business uh, with significant presence in China was buying one of my clients. And one of the issues in contention uh, during the course of the deal, one of the first things we, we needed to see if we could agree upon is whose law controlled. 
uh, because as you're crafting these documents, you need to craft them with that in mind. Does the law of the state of New York apply? Does the law of Delaware apply? Does the law of the Hague Convention apply, uh, which is an international conference among uh, countries that signed on to a treatise? Uh, does the law of China apply to the extent that uh, China uh, is, is not as strict in, in terms of enforcing their intellectual pro or in terms of anybody enforcing intellectual property rights? Uh, in that matter, uh, we determined for whatever reason that all disputes would be handled and resolved in accordance with the law of the UK and resolved by arbitration in London. Uh, and it's just a, a neutral deal third party, I guess. No, no, but it's just a deal point that the parties worked out. Uh, okay. In my view, far better than having the dispute resolved in China. Uh, but the other side absolutely didn't want the, the dispute resolved in the U.S. by court. So uh, one of the first things you should look at if you're going to be involved in an international transaction is what law applies and what are you going to do if there's a fight? And I would assume if uh, for some reason someone goes ahead and does that, that the the uh, the the law would govern with the the foreign country, whatever their courts determine is legally binding here in the U.S.? Well, that becomes very complex as to choice of law provisions and whose law applies. And the U.S. has uh, typically most states have a choice of law analysis when you determine I'm not going to bore you or, or the listeners, but you can get into a fight if you don't agree beforehand as to whose law applies and where's the, where's the dispute going to be governed. Yeah, well, certainly that would uh, determine the need for counsel and any time you're going to tr start transacting business outside the country. Without a doubt, you know, please call Mark and his team. Um, so talk about complexity. Uh, let's let's go into uh, when, you know, you're trying to figure out down the line, you got a couple partners that you need to have an agreement in a place, a buy-sell agreement. Um, how do they start? What's What do they look at? Well, one of the things that I like to talk to clients about when you have a buy-sell or you're a, a group of family members or a group of friends or partners forming a business is everybody's usually getting along in the beginning. And what I ask is, what is this gonna look like if you're not getting along? And how do you wanna resolve an issue if let's say there are three of you and one of you is a little bit older and is starting to work less and less and less and taking more time off and moving to Florida. How are you, usually there's animosity that follows and how are you gonna resolve that animosity so the business can continue if those circumstances uh, pose as a threat to business continuity? So, so it, it's almost making uh, relationships as you go along before you can even get into the, the contract itself. When, when you're thinking about moving forward with the business and yet task a lawyer with the, with drafting an operating agreement. One of the things you want to think about is think of it maybe as a prenup. What's it going to look like? And what's this business going to look like? God forbid, if the three of you are not getting along, how are you going to vote out or get rid of or squeeze out or oppress somebody uh, so they no longer are a problem or, or, or getting in the way of, of the business as it moves forward? and your operating agreement or shareholders agreement, the number one issue that I see lacking in shareholder agreements or operating agreements when people come together to form a business are the dissolution provisions. What are you gonna do if there's a problem? How are you gonna value this thing? And how are you gonna vote or get somebody out that no longer belongs in the business? Understood, those are key components that really need to be addressed you know, before or the problem. How are you gonna protect yourself if two other of the owners are ganging up on you. And so these are some of the most important provisions that I see are often not addressed in shareholder or operating agreements. And I wish they were addressed more often. It would save business owners lots and lots of headaches and sleepless nights. And even if they are addressed, uh, I just like to point out to my listeners that uh, you put that in a draw for later, but you do need to uh, you know, update the valuations you know, maybe not annually, but at least from time to time, correct? Yeah, uh, there should be a valuation mechanism uh, that remains relevant because it's not going to come up uh, year one. It never comes up in year two. 
hardly by year five. It's like you said, put it in the draw and 10 years later when someone or someone's kid becomes a problem or someone passes away or someone's wife becomes a problem that you got to pull out the agreement and look at it. And not only how do we uh, alleviate ourselves of the problem of the dissenting shareholder, but how do we value the business and pay? What is it, what is it that we're going to pay that constitutes some fair value to get rid of the problem? Do you need sometimes to have separate counsel? I mean, if you had, let's say, two brothers, a sister and a father, is, is that common? Or, where, or is it always really just one counsel trying to make everybody a happy family? I mean, you, I mean I've just done it this past week uh, where uh, three best friends uh, from, from college days, and now they're in their late 20s, early 30s, are forming a business together in South Florida. And uh, I was brought in to, to serve as counsel and, and to help them formulate their operating agreement. And uh, I was brought in by one of the families. And what the other two do is they acknowledge that I'm serving as uh, corporate counsel for the entity uh, and that I had previously uh, represented one of the families independently. And I may go on to continue representing one of the families independently or the other two independently. And uh, they agree to waive the conflict if they'd like uh, for me to represent the entity in its entirety in the formation of its business documents, or everybody can get their own counsel and negotiate amongst themselves. That later latter process obviously is much more expensive and takes more time. Uh, right. It's much more streamlined if we're engaged uh, to represent the company and just do what's best for the company. Yeah. So as long as there's constant communication, transparency being the key, you know, have one person deal in the cards, it saves expense, but gets the, the buy sell agreement in place properly. Uh, would like to point out always to our listeners that, that these agreements, when you look at it, sometimes valuations can be staggering. And uh, life insurance is a key component. Uh, you could put some inexpensive term life insurance in place on key individuals to help fund the mechanism should there be you know, a, a potential death to one of the partners. Well, it's often a, a leading component of, of uh, buyout because if, the, if you have a business with uh, three owners uh, and one passes away, typically the other two don't wanna be partners with the uh, decedent's wife. And so life insurance is a, is a mechanism by which you can buy out that, that third uh, deceased uh, former member and move on with the business. Yep, just transfer the financial risks over. Um, good stuff there, Mark. Uh, really something that uh, a lot of business owners, I think it keeps them up at night. Uh, and these are questions they ask themselves every day and, and, and I know you, you can solve them. Let me just give you the hypothetical um, and, uh -oh. and this, this is not meant to scare business owners, but if they don't do this and, and, and then there is a, a fatality or a disability or, or a dissolution request of one of the partners, what happens? I, I know it gets ugly, but just let people know what happens. Look, if, it's, if parties are not getting along and there's no guiding document or the guiding document is silent as, pardon me, as to what happens in, in a sense where the where the parties are not getting along, it could mean years of litigation and hundreds and hundreds of thousands of dollars in attorney's fees and expert fees to value the business. And you are so far better off spending less than $10,000, oftentimes less than $7,500 uh, in putting together an operating agreement or a shareholder agreement for your business that's generating millions for you and your family. Uh, then years later fighting about it. Uh, I've, I've tried a lot of cases where there are owners of businesses fighting amongst themselves for control of customers, uh, intellectual property, and for control of the business. And you are far better off having a document. It's the insurance policy if something goes wrong. You're far better off having that than fighting for years. That That is excellent advice. So anyone who's been on the fence, been thinking about or hesitating, do this immediately. You have to get an agreement in place because it, while it's a tough thing to discuss sometimes amongst family members and partners, it's better to do it now because it'll be a lot uh, costlier later on and, and, and a lot more fighting. And so, it's usually easy to get done when people are getting along. Right. Uh, 
There are common provisions and agreements that we recommend. We plug them in. Everybody looks, has their chance to put in their two cents, review it, revise it. If you want to get independent counsel, go get independent counsel, look at the agreement, let's get it done, sign it, and then put it in that drawer, and hopefully you never take it out. There you have it, listeners. Mark will write the agreement. I'll, I'll, I'll write the life insurance policy. It'll all be done within 30 days. <laughs> Let's uh, let's tackle uh, one of the other topics I promised our listeners in the beginning of the episode that we were going to discuss, and and it's one that people question all the time on restricted covenants, non competes. Why don't we talk about that for a little bit, Mark? Uh, I, I recommend to my clients that have cust- significant customer bases that they should have post employment. Uh, restrictions on their employees who deal with customers. It's just something that should be done. Uh, All employees, not just rainmakers all the way through to service level. My suggestion is that anybody that has access to the confidential information, to the customer list, anybody that has access to that should be bound to the post-employment restrictions. If the business is customer oriented uh, and you're having access, anybody that has access should be bound. If the business is technology related uh, and there are those that have access to the technology, those are the individuals that should be bound. The purpose of the post-employment restrictions is to protect the business's confidential information. Those that have the access and the ability to take it and go should be bound to the post-employment restrictions. It's great advice. Now to implement that, I know a lot of office manuals, including ours, has a confidentiality clause uh, is that something that, you know, needs to be signed by the employee or what do you recommend there? So there are a bunch of ways to do it. You can do it the, uh, the way that uh, we all know, which is the restrictive covenant in an employment contract. Uh, you can help protect your confidential information by having it a, a provision in your employment agreement uh, that has the business's confidentiality policy or confidential information policy, and just make sure you, you, you keep records that every employee has acknowledged receiving the handbook with that policy in it. While your uh, employment agreement is always the best way to do it, uh, if you're not going to have employment agreements designating those that have access to the information, signing post-employment restrictions, certainly every business in its employee handbook should have a confidentiality provision describing what the confidential information is that or at least the what the business considers the information to be confidential and the restrictions specific restrictions that every employee knows they're not to use it disseminate it transfer it sell it or do anything with the confidential information that may come into their possession except to use it to discharge their duties as an employee or owner or shareholder very important covenant for people to have in place. I've heard, you know, horror Under- stories. Enforceable. Sometimes from- I hear from people, oh, they're not enforceable or they're not enforceable for more than a year. Or I heard they're not enforceable for 18 months. I mean, no, they are enforceable. Most commercial states, New York, New Jersey, these post-employment restrictions are enforceable. Now, there are ways you can get out of it and we can go into some of the nuances of it, but typically you can restrain somebody for two to three years and it depends on the industry with a with a reasonable geographic scope and prevent them from competing with your business. And that becomes a significant sword in protecting your confidential information, protecting a sales manager or a salesman from leaving and stealing what you have worked hard for. And we need to protect our, our listeners here. I mean, they've worked hard, uh, sometimes, you know, generations before them building up the business and, and one bad actor could kind of take that out. So, you know, I, I, I think you recommend with, uh, you know, pretty much the maybe main uh, rainmakers in an organization, the leading salespeople uh, to have a complete contract in place, you know, with that restricted covenant, correct? Absolutely. But one of the nuances of this of this field of law is that if you have a team of 10 salespeople, let's say, and two are your your best rainmakers, if you only have post employment restrictions with those two, uh, those two 
post-employment restrictions may be deemed invalid and unenforceable because you didn't have them in a uniform means among all of your salespeople, all of whom had access to the confidential information. Wow. Wow. You're saying they could be discriminatory because you didn't do it across the board? Well, the whole basis for it is why these two, right? You must not consider uh, the information that you're looking to protect so super secret if only these two super rainmakers are restricted from their post post employment conduct but everybody else can go and take the list or go and compete no you've got to employ this in a uniform manner wow that, that's great information yeah because you know you, you think okay i have to do it here and here and i know a lot of people at least in my industry in insurance they didn't want to put a contract in place they didn't want to, you know, maybe give equity or, or stock in the organization, which would have been part of that discussion. So uh, they did contracts with some and not contracts with other. But, you know, that's a, that's a great piece of advice to do it across the board because you don't want to leave any gaps with something like this. And your post-employment restriction can be deemed unenforceable uh, if only one or two people in the organization have it. You have to be careful with it yeah, and you have to enforce it and you have to enforce it uniformly. If you have it for everybody and one person leaves and is not hurting you and competing and you let them compete and go and then somebody else who leaves six months later and that person is hurting you, the person who just left recently can use as a defense that you're not enforcing these. So they must not be worth much to you and use that as a means to avoid the enforceability of the restrictive covenants. Take it from the master litigator. He's seen it from all angles and he's- Oh, I do this often. He's I mean, trying to help you cover your gaps, listeners. So take, take him at his word. And I'm able to enforce post-employment restrictions uh, frequently. And even when a business does not have a post-employment restriction with a key employee, we're often able to uh, stop that uh, departing shareholder, owner, or employee from pillaging the business's customer list or technology uh, and, and competing unlawfully. I, I wrote an article about it recently, uh, the secrets of trade secret litigation. And if you Double have- Double secret, I love it. <laughs> and if you're a business that has uh, uh, trade secrets, and most do, whether it's the simple customer list or some uh, software or technology or just the manner and methodology that you do business, which you've developed over the course of decades, it's something you want to protect and courts will protect you. Listeners, Mark Gross knows the secret, and that's what we do here on the Secret Sauce 365 podcast is we, we, we give you answers to the secrets that other people don't want you to know. Um, you know, Mark, I, I, I can't thank you enough. Uh, you know, you, you, you've given us a wealth of information, um, you know, I, just from the use of email uh, to just really, you know, things that struck me here is just to, to slow down, right? We're, we're in a business environment on a daily basis. You, you know, sometimes you're waking up 6 a.m. to text messages and, and we didn't even get into that topic. Maybe that's a future podcast. We'll talk about validity of text messages, but, Same but as email. you know, emails, phone calls, everybody wants instant gratification. And it's not like the the seventies or eighties where you could take time to, to do re replies and responses, but you really need to uh, in some of these situations, uh, especially like you said, if you're dealing with a bad actor and, 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 and you get that cold sweat or your stomach turns, you need to take your time. You need to get counsel and you need to make sure things are buttoned up. Right. I agree. <laughs> Definitely. You're far better off protecting yourself in advance of the problem than having to clean up after the fact. Yes. And, 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 and no one wants to go to court and, and have their words taken out of context. So, so to our listeners out there, I, I appreciate you sharing your time with us today. And uh, we want to all thank you, Mark, for being with us. We wish you and your family uh, continued success and, and, and prosperity and good health. Um, so thank you very much for your time. And my best to you and your family. Thank you. Thank you for listening to another episode of Secret Sauce 365. Your feedback is how we grow. So please leave us a rating and review on your favorite platform. And if you want access to even more great information, go to secretsauce365.com.